God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a great joy to be back with you here at Iona Hope. And I want you to know, let me just do a little piece of personal housekeeping right up front before I get into the sermonic material that you came here to enjoy. You're not supposed to laugh. <laughs> um, I'm, doing, I'm doing great. And... Uh, thank you. But I'm still in the process, and, and so um, I won't be shaking any of your hands or hugging you or actually even distributing communion because then I would be touching your hands. So, um, but I go back to the doctor tomorrow, and uh, I'm hoping that I'll be released from those kind of cautionary measures, but I don't know that yet. Uh, as far as I know, I am uh, free of any illness, and uh, I have just wispy hair. So, so there you go. It's a new look. So having said all of that, let me start with the, here's the actual beginning of the sermon, okay? All right. It's difficult not to be cynical, especially in a presidential election year. <laughs> And I'm not actually talking about any particular person at all, as much as all of them. <laughs> and when we come together for worship here in this place and start the day with the penitential segment of the Ash Wednesday service, which is that which helps us be completely mindful of our own inadequacies and our ability to say, mercy for me, judgment for others. You can laugh there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that we're pretty good at that. And that particular form of prayer is very specific about all of our own failings. And so when we listen to what St. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, when he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, which actually means we regard no one from the flesh perspective, which actually means we regard no one with a sense of hostility against God, hostility that we know so well. And then we think, well, you know, it's a presidential year, and we begin to remember that we regard a lot of people with hostility, sometimes even ourselves. This diocese lost a wonderful priest this week to, a, to an untimely death. And one of the things about her that is so helpful is that I know that she went through a number of issues in her life with her family and other items, and she came out of the other end of all of those regular kind of relational distresses that any of us can experience and became kind. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. difficult not to be cynical and yet be mindful of the fact that the holy scriptures of the church 
state emphatically and help us be mindful and purposeful of the fact that God has changed history, God has changed creation. And yet, we don't always act like it. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. Now, you know, it's, it's um, kind of the preacher's nightmare to preach on Christmas, Easter, the Good Samaritan, or the story of the prodigal son. <laughs> because everybody knows those stories so well, it's not like you can get in with a specific edge and say anything new or novel, which is probably better that way. So I'm not going to say anything new or novel, but I am going to point to a little bit of context. When Jesus told this story, according to Luke's gospel, then Jesus said, well, it's after he said some other things. And we, we get the, uh, the intro, which is basically a biblical interpretation before the story happens. And the intro is this. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one? Or he told them this parable. What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and search? Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. Something about searching for the lost. And when he gets to the parable of the two sons, not just the one son, we hear a story in which there's a younger son. Now, if you're versed in the Bible, which I know all of you are, you're conversant with the reality that in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament in particular, there's a lot of stories about two sons. And very often it's the younger son who gets the glory, gets the reward, gets the benefit of being the family name bearer. And so when Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons, and it's the younger one who goes off, the expectation then is going to be, and he screws up. But then he comes back with great glory because he figured it all out, and he's the representative of the family name, hurrah, hurrah, isn't everything great? Which is, of course, not the way the story goes. The way the story goes is he's eating lunch with the pigs, which is the worst possible thing. He has no glory. He comes to himself and has a little sense of, maybe I can just go home and my dad will feed me and let me live out in the back. And he goes home. And then there's the other son, the son who should inherit all the best. And he's angry, and he goes up to his father who comes outside to him and does not even say, Father. He says, listen. And then he doesn't even say, my brother. He says, this son of yours. So basically, both sons failed to live up to the respect for their father. And the way Jesus tells the story, it has no conclusion. It simply stops. Which makes us go back to 
And all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, let's talk about these guys for a little bit. Tax collectors are not just people who receive your 1040s. These are people who are working for the government holding them in oppression. So, in other words, they're your neighbors who have betrayed you. So, sure, forgive them their sins, but my God, don't invite them home. What are you doing eating with them? So Jesus tells a story. There was a man who had two sons. And one was obedient and followed all the rules and didn't leave home. And there was another son who left everything and came home and said, Father. And the father, who beseeches both sons, says, let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate, and the story ends. And we don't know. Is the older son going to go in? Because there was a man who had two sons. Now, when we're cynical, we, I, don't look at people with a godly perspective. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. I'm not really doing great on that one. But I remember that there, there are lots of examples, like the priest who died, who learned how to be kind, who learned how to forgive, who learned how to give mercy. Happy are they whose transgression is forgiven, the psalmist says. I remember the first time that I told a priest something I had done when I was eight years old. And when the priest forgave me, after I had said those words, I broke into sobs because I felt free. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven. And I didn't even know I'd been carrying a burden. Now, all of us gathered here today are here because we believe on some level internally that this gospel story about this Jesus is true and that God did something to the world because of him and through him. And what St. Paul says is that there's a new creation. All this is from God. And that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Wow. Are you ready for that? Well, you know what? You are ready for that. Because you don't have to actually accomplish it. It's already accomplished. You just get the opportunity to live into it. I'm here today to say the prayers of the church over some individuals standing before you, which will strengthen the life of this church as it strengthens the lives of individuals. And what we pray for, essentially, is what we just sang, come Holy Spirit, come. 
give these people God power to look at no one with a hostile point of view because there's a new creation. Because you know, there was a father who had all the sons in the world. There was a father who had all the daughters in the world and wanted them all to come home to the loving embrace. So, you are the church. The church often gets a black eye because of the way we act. But I can tell you that the church more often gets a loving eye because of the way we act and the way we are. Those prayers that we opened up with point out all of our failures, and boy, we have a lot of them, and they happen every day in every life. But the living text of the church is that all this, all this, all this is from God, working God's purpose out in us. So I just ask you one simple question to end this. Who in your life does God need you to forgive? I did not just say that you can do something that's cheap and easy. I did just say that with God, it is accomplished. So, who do you need to forgive? I just end with this. I've known many, many people over the course of my priesthood <coughs> that really had to wrestle and work hard, sometimes for 10, 30, or more years, to let go of the harm that had been done to their heart. But in the letting go, discovered, happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Jesus told a story. There was a man who had two sons.